Okay, and we are live. Hello, everybody. ¿Qué tal, amigos? I hope everybody is having a fantastic day today. Thursday evening, 7.30 p.m. mainland Spain time. And uh, looking at the chat section, we've already got plenty of activity happening in that ch chat section. We've got David coming in from an island in Essex. We've got Bab coming in from Bab's coming in from Wales. Melanie coming in from I don't know where. Aaron coming in from Ireland. Uh, Ricardo Reed coming in from North London. Awad coming in from Saudi Arabia. Diablo España. Super chat from Diablo. Thank you very much for that. Diablo five euros. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. And uh, don't forget anybody who wants to. Uh, contribute to the channel you can through the super chat or super sticker option all right good now let's have a look and see what the main news stories that we're going to look at today we're going to have a look at some news and also some comments so we'll be checking those out in just a moment and also we'll be going through the chat section and checking out what is happening there Jose Antonio coming in from Ciudad Real. We've got Martin coming in from Estepona and plenty of people coming through. Scott from Leicester and uh, Tobias coming in from the United States. Grant coming in from Asturias. So lots of familiar faces in the chat section today. Now, the first piece of news that we will look at is this one here. Let's have a look. And it says that inflation slows down in April to 8.4% due to lower energy prices. Inflation stood at 8.4% 8, 8 in April, according to the advanced data published on Thursday by the National Statistics Institute. The decline compared to March when it reached 9.8% on the verge of double digits breaks the, trend of a, breaks the trend of strong price rises in recent months and opens the door to the possibility that prices have finally reached a ceiling. But this, is, but this does not imply a return to normality for the moment. They continue to grow at historically very high levels and the return to moderate rates, according to the main international organizations, will take months yet. So there we go. That is the situation at the moment regarding inflation. As we saw last month, I think it hit 9.8%. And as we can see here, down to 8.4%. So down slightly. And uh, apparently this is due to the uh, discounted fuel and uh, cheaper energy prices in general. And uh, hopefully, as we saw yesterday, energy prices in general are going to come down as a result of that, uh, uh, that price cap on natural gas, which I think is going to be capped at a certain price, I think around 50 euros per megawatt. Um, I can't remember exactly what the figures were, but around 50 euros, I think, was the price. And the government's hoping that that is going to bring the price of electricity down and also inflation back to manageable figures. All right, let's have a look at the chat. What have we got going on? We've got uh, Chris coming in from Alora, Dirk coming in from Bia Joyosa, Lacey coming in from Atlanta, Steve coming in from the UK, plenty of activity in the chat section. We didn't break the record the other day. I thought we might have broken the record, but we didn't. We were about 80 chat comments off the record, unfortunately. Dave coming in from the UK, staying around Gatwick until Spain allows us unvaccinated to enter. Don't worry, Dave, it should be soon as the uh, rules uh, for the unvaccinated are slowly being lifted around the world. So I imagine it's only going to be a question of time for that. Angela coming in. Hello, Angela from Cork. Mark coming in from Leeds. Pat from Galicia. And Yvonne from San Fulgencio in Alicante. Hello to everybody in the chat section today. All right, second piece of news that we're going to look at is this one here. The Madrid Metro withdraws 10% of the trains in circulation due to the electricity price hikes. Hmm, the, the increase in the price of electricity, which on Sunday the 23rd of April reached one of the, one of the highest rises of the year, up to 146.95 euros megawatt hour, has forced Metro to Ma the, the Madrid to take measures. This is what company sources have told Europa Press. 10% of the trains in circulations have been withdrawn in order to achieve a saving in the daily costs 
that the company has to face every day. This will allow the company to continue to provide a quality service they have assured. The president, Isabel de Fiuso, had already warned in March that the increase in costs, costs had been sevenfold. So, Metro de Madrid having to withdraw 10% of trains in circulation. So what does that mean for people catching the Metro every day in Madrid? Well, even though the uh, company says that uh, it won't uh, drop its quality service, 10% less trains means that there will be some uh, problems with the service. And as we know, Madrid Metro has been reducing service over the last decade maybe or so and by reducing it 10% more because of high electricity prices not good longer waits for trains and more crowded trains uh, during peak hours basically that is what I think will be the result of that no doubt now let's go back into the chat section we've got uh, David coming in from Birmingham Sandra coming in from Durham in North Carolina, not Durham, England. Byron coming in from North Carolina as well. Uh, greetings from Chris, who has moved to Barcelona from Nashville. Hello, Chris. Hope you are enjoying your time there. She uh, Seamus coming in from Boston. And uh, plenty of activity in the chat section as usual, which is good to see. And uh, hopefully we'll break the record today the record that we couldn't break the other day, unfortunately. Now, the third piece of news. Let's see what's on the agenda today. Algeria threatens to break gas contract with Spain if pipeline with Morocco reopens. Algeria threatens Spain with breaking the gas supply contract if the government of Pedro Sanchez uses the Margrev gas pipeline to send out Algerian gas to Morocco. The Algerian Ministry of Energy warns in a statement released by the state news agency that it has learned through an email sent by the Vice President of Ecological Transition, Teresa Rivera, that Spain will reopen the Moroccan pipeline in the coming hours in the opposite direction, that is, to deliver gas to Morocco. Mm, so this um, gas saga with Algeria and Morocco changing regularly. We saw the other day uh, how... Spain-Algerian relations are a bit rocky at the moment because of what's happening in the Western Sahara area. Spain has chosen to go in favour, let's say, of Morocco rather than Algeria in that disputed territory. And um, the problem is that Spain gets 60% of its gas supplies, I believe, from Algeria. And Algeria is worried that, the, that uh, Algeria is going to send the gas to Spain and Spain's going to send it into Morocco the arch enemy of Algeria. So they're a little bit worried about that. And as we can see here, they're threatening to break that gas contract. And if they break the gas, if they break the gas contract, where is Spain going to get its gas from? That is the question. Because as we know, difficult to source natural gas at the moment here in Europe. Luckily, we're going into the summer months, so uh, we won't be so dependent on natural gas. But once winter comes around again, come October, November, December, we need those gas supplies. And it's interesting that we have built economies in the Western world on products that we don't have. So it is a bit of an issue, as we know, when a crisis occurs. Now, let's go into the uh, chat section here. I'll see if I can find something to put on the screen. Let's see if I can get... We've got Aaron who says, uh, roll on June and my trip to Malaga. Uh, Aaron obviously looking forward to his trip to Malaga. Tobias says that GDP in the first quarter in the US fell by 1.8%. Falling around the world, I think, at the moment uh, in various places, I think, Tobias. Economy's suffering. And, uh, and uh, we'll see if we can pull another chat out here. Uh, real inflation is probably closer to 2%, says Aaron. Oh, sorry, 20% says Aaron. Don't really know, but prices are on the way up here, definitely. And uh, City Fan has just joined us. Por fin está aquí, he says. All right, good. We've got one here from Maga. Maga says, hola, amigos. Checking in from El Campello, looking out uh, to the med, drinking my Corona and waiting for my fajita mixta. 
Thank goodness the rain has stopped for a while. Yes, Mugger, the weather hasn't been the best, unfortunately. I think we're going to get some better weather next week, or at least that's what the forecast on my phone says for this part of Spain, and I imagine that, that if this part of Spain the weather is okay, the rest of the country, or at least in the Mediterranean area, I imagine, should be better. So hopefully that will be the case. All right, good. Now let's go back into the last piece of news here today. And uh, we've got uh, wine, beer, how the nanny state is advancing in Spain. How the nanny state is advancing in Spain. The Ministry of Health is working on a cardiovascular health strategy that directly targets alcohol sold in restaurants and bars. Although it is not a ban at the moment, it is a recommendation that aims to direct and guide the behaviour of employers and consumers. In recent years, the, the PSOE and Podemos government has introduced new laws and regulations restrict, uh, restricting gambling, betting and betting advertising, as well as tax increases on plastic or increases on the VAT on sugary drinks. So Spain heading towards a nanny state. And uh, I thought that by leaving Australia, I had left nanny states behind because uh, anybody who knows how Australia works will know that it is a nanny state. Uh, <laughs> but I thought coming to Spain that would change. But we are moving towards a nanny state here in Spain. And uh, as we can see, they're starting to, they're starting to target things like alcohol and um, and uh, other foods that uh, the government considers that that are not healthy, sugary sugary drinks and things like that. Now it all comes down to whether people are able to take their own choices, yeah, uh, uh, take their own decisions on what they put into their bodies. That is the debate. Should the government be telling us how much sugar we can put into our bodies? Should the government be telling us how much alcohol we can drink? Those are the questions. Um, uh, should they be telling us how many cigarettes we can smoke? Those are the questions. We know what the arguments are, that the health system in the long run pays for this, and some people do need help with their diets, for example. We understand that. Uh, obesity is a problem that is increasing around the world, not only here in Spain, but other countries as well. And um, high salt levels and things as well. A lot of processed foods available at the supermarkets. People are moving towards more processed diets rather than fresh food diets. And uh, the government here feeling that it needs to step in and, um, and uh, control people's eating and drinking habits. What do you think? Should they be stepping in or not? Or should people be able to take their own decisions? That's the question. Uh, recently, they decided to limit the amount of salt that bakers can put in bread. Don't know exactly what the the new regulation is, but obviously they cut, they uh, bakers are forced to cut down on the amount of salt that they put in bread because the government considers that it is unhealthy for the population. S uh, bread with too much salt, so they passed the law uh, limiting the amount of um, salt that bakers can put in bread at a national level. And as we saw there, also as I mentioned with the sugary drinks, taxes on sugary drinks costs more money to buy a can of Coke nowadays than it did last year. So prices going up because of government intervention. So let me know what you think. Good idea or bad idea when it comes to this government intervention? And is Spain heading towards a nanny state? That is the question. Now let's go back into the, um, the uh, chat section here. Let's see what we've got going on. Plenty of activity happening in the chat section. So I don't know whether I can find one to bring out on the screen. I'll see if I can find one. In the meantime, what I'll do is uh, go to the first comment that we'll look at today and check out what was uh, happening on yesterday's comment section. Um, Pat's put a comment here. She says, the amount of salt in processed meat is much higher than I am used to. I have tried to find bacon that is edible uh, with no luck. Yes, that's it. When it comes to processed food, uh, Pat, there is a lot of uh, salt and additives in that food. And that's what people need to be careful with. And as I said, a lot of people are moving towards those diets. And uh, it's because we've got less time to cook. We've got um, less time to go shopping. And when you do go shopping, I don't know whether it's me or other people have noticed this as well, but when you go to a supermarket like Mercadona here in Spain, for example, the processed food section where they have this pre-prepared already packaged food gets bigger and bigger every year. There's always seems to be more pizzas, 
more um, pastas available there, sandwiches and food that is pre-prepared. Paella also comes pre-prepared nowadays. The Spanish tortilla comes pre-prepared. And of course, you can't control the amount of uh, salt and sugars and things like that that are in this food. So that's probably why the government is deciding to step in and do something about this. Uh, people moving away from the, um, the fresh, food, fresh food diets, unfortunately. Now, the first comment that we'll look at today, let's have a look here. This one from Iggy, talking about tapas, which is a discussion that we uh, started the other day. Best tapas are in Bailen. So uh, sorry to people in Granada. They even have tapa menus where you get to choose which hot or cold tapa you want a menu for free food, sign me up. So there we go, Bailen in Jaén, a city down there in Jaén, uh, in between Castilla-La Mancha and Granada is Jaén, and uh, Bailen, according to Iggy, has the best tapas in Spain. As I said, we started this debate the other day. My personal opinion is that Granada has the best tapas in Spain. Avila also has very good tapas. We saw um, Jose Antonio say the other day that Ciudad Theo Real has very good tapas as well. And Iggy weighing into the debate saying that Bailen has fantastic tapas as well. So we're getting to find out some of the best cities in Spain when it comes to the infamous tapa. All right, good. Let's go. Jose Antonio says... Bailen, that's very true. All right, there we go. We've got uh, confirmation of uh, Iggy's statement. All right, what else we got going in here? We've got, uh, we've, uh, Diablo says that we've had incredible thunderstorms and rain flooded the town yesterday, he says. And today, so I see some roads have massive holes like two meters plus wide from the weight of the water. Yes, that's true. When uh, the water comes down, the infrastructure and roads do suffer, Diablo. And uh, heavy rain here in Madrid also last night, heavy, um, heavy storms. So uh, heavy rain affecting the country at the moment, or at least the uh, Madrid part of the country, south and east, I believe. All right, now let's go into the second comment. Barry says... There is no excuse for delays at airports. The UK people are still human beings. This is positive, this is positive discrimination. Question mark. I don't know whether that's a question mark or a statement. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Now, the problem that we saw yesterday was that um, people in the UK were complaining that at Easter time their flights were delayed. And apparently in Madrid, some 3,000 people missed flights. Now, I don't know where those people were from, whether they were local people or or people heading to different destinations around the world. But apparently the problem was that there weren't enough staff on at the airport. National Police Passport Control. That was one of the reasons for the holdups for people traveling to non-EU destinations, because as we know, if you travel to a country in the Schengen area, you don't have to pass through passport control. Um, and... The article said that some people were complaining of discrimination because Irish people were hopping on planes without any trouble, but British people were getting held up at the gate or at, the, or, or at passport control. And obviously that's because if you belong to the European Union, which Ireland, Ireland does, you, uh, you go through a different gate directly. But I don't think it was discrimination. I just think it's one EU country, as I said yesterday, versus a country that's not in the EU. Another thing is the airport not having the necessary staff to handle the demand. And the person that we saw yesterday from the Airport Association or the um, Aviation, Aviation Association here in Spain said that he wants the airports to be fully staffed, ready for the summer season, and not to have these delays. Because it's not a good image for the country, people having to queue up for... Um, hours and possibly miss flights uh, to non-European Union countries. But this is a problem that's always happened. It's not unique to Spain. I remember going to England about 10 years ago. I was with my girlfriend, who's a European citizen. She went straight through. I got stuck in passport control because two flights from the United States came in at the same time. And of course, me with my Australian passport back in the day, I had to go through the rest of the world gate and it took me about 45 minutes or an hour to get through. And my girlfriend was waiting for me there for at least 
30 minutes because she got through relatively quickly because those European passports went straight through. And uh, the rest of the world, which uh, I was included in and still am included in, had to go through a different gate. So these long queues at airports, because you don't belong to the country uh, where you are or you are non-European Union in this case, can take a little bit longer. But hopefully the Spanish airport system is going to get it together and get that problem sorted out before because there's nothing worse than rocking up at the airport here in Spain off an international flight, which I've done a few times, and you get to the uh, passport control and there's only one or two police officers working and those queues can be long. Spanish people fly through, but uh, non-Spanish people, of course, get their passports checked, scanned, stamped sometimes, so the process can take longer. But hopefully they will get that sorted out before the summer season. Now, let's go into another uh, comment here. Gaz, hi Stu, thanks for the vids. My electric bill was 54 euros this month. I received it this morning. Just been home to Manchester last weekend. No queues, smooth transition both ways. So no problems heading back to Manchester from Spain, which is good to see, Gaz. I think the problems are at those peak times. For example, the Easter month, long weekends. There's another long weekend here this weekend coming up, at least in Madrid anyway. And uh, what's the uh, holiday? I think it's the Madrid Community Day. So a lot of people from Madrid will be traveling. So uh, be warned, people on the coast, people from Madrid will be heading there this weekend for the public holiday. Uh, but um, as I said, if you're not traveling in those peak times, so for example, if you're traveling back to the UK on a normal week, you shouldn't have any problems. But Easter time, of course, when um, I don't know how many more millions of people are traveling, school holidays, times like that, you can uh, face queues at the airport. Christmas time, when I normally travel, very, very busy sometimes coming into Spain or leaving Spain. So hopefully we get those um, those uh, problems sorted out and people get through airports quickly and nobody misses their flight because there's nothing worse than missing your flight, in my opinion. Now let's have a look at uh, some of the comments that we have here, some of the chat section. Thunderstorms uh, in Alora as well, says Chris. Uh, San Fulgencio, also thunderstorms. Puerto Lumbreras in Murcia, Simon is there. Uh, the worst weather in 16 years, says the campsite owner. There we go, the worst weather in 16 years in Murcia, according to the owner of the campsite there. So that's what we're dealing with here at the moment. Pat says, sunny weather in Galicia. As I said the other day, Pat, it's always the case. When it's sunny in the north, it rains in the rest of the country. When it rains where you are, it's sunny everywhere else. That's the way Spain works, especially with those Atlantic storms coming through there in Galicia. Uh, Carmen Barcelona, according to City Fan, good. Uh, what else we got going on here? Uh, really cold in the UK for April, says Amanda. Yeah, cold here in Spain as well. Steve says, a bit of an attack on the palms, Stu. No, no attack from me, Steve. I'm just uh, reading the news, mate. Um, the uh, discrimination was pointed out, and I don't think that is in a... It's not discrimination. It's just the fact that when you go through a non-European Union gate, it can take longer. Join the club. I've been doing it for the last 20 years, Steve, coming into the European Union on a non-European Union passport. It can be a nightmare. It's just what it is. It's what it is. You know, if you go to the States and you're not, and you're not a U.S. citizen, you also get uh, longer queues at the airport. If you go to Australia and you're not an Australian citizen, you wait longer than the Aussies. Just the way the world works, unfortunately, when it, when it comes to airports. But um, I don't think there's discrimination going on between the Irish and British. It's just the way it is. But uh, as I said, hopefully the airports will get in, get in shape and there will be enough police manning, or manning those positions. All right, good. Let's have a look what else is going on. Uh, Dirk says, when are British people going to realize that they're not in the EU anymore? The majority know that, Dirk, I think. But there are some people that still don't understand why they don't have the same privileges as before. And uh, as we know, it's simply because when you're not part of the EU, you don't get EU privileges. But it was a democratic vote. Let's put it out there. And people chose what they chose. No point, no point um, 
No point uh, complaining. Now the next one here from Welsh Toro. My flight out of Britain was terrible. Shortage of staff. Shortage of staff in the UK. Shortage of staff everywhere. Uh, a lot of people off work with COVID at the moment. I was talking to somebody yesterday who works in a bank. She's in a team of 300 people and she says she's never seen so many people off work currently during the whole pandemic. So a lot of people off work with COVID at the moment. So it's still there. Even though there's nothing in the press, it is still causing people to miss uh, work and it's still still causing service industry jobs to be short-staffed. That's the reality as well when it comes to the pandemic. All right, let's have a look. What else we got going on here in the chat section? Uh, let's see if I can find one or two more to bring out. Let's see if I can get a couple here. I'll keep going through that in a minute. We've got uh, Ivan in the chat section as well. Hi, Stu, all good, happy as I'm booking tickets to relax and be happy in Barcelona for a week in June. I know you like Barcelona. I know you like Barcelona, Catalonia, Ivan. So hopefully you have a fantastic time there again in June. And uh, everybody else who's planning to come to this country over the next few months, I hope everybody has a good time. I'm sure Spain is wanting you to be here, enjoying the country. I'm sure. Now let's have a look at the final comment today. Wendy Moore, if you believe the king has only 2.5 million euros, then you will believe anything. Well, to be honest, Wendy, uh, I do believe the king only has 2.5 mil. I wouldn't mind to have 2.5 mil in the bank account if I'm completely honest with you, but of course, I'm not, uh, I'm not royal. But uh, compared to other European royalty, the Spanish king doesn't have a lot of cash. He lives off a state budget because all of his assets were seized, I believe, back in the day. And of course, if you know the story of Spanish royalty, which I don't really know that well, I know, I know the basics of it, but the, the, uh, the, uh, the former King Juan Carlos was in exile for many years in Portugal, I believe, and uh, he was brought back to be the monarch of Spain again because Spain became a republic back in the 1930s, I think it was. They had a few republics back then. The uh, monarchy was uh, banished. They uh, became a republic, then a dictatorship, and then uh, Franco brought the king back, re re-established the monarchy. But uh, one of the things was that they weren't a traditional European monarchy, like, uh, for example, in uh, the Netherlands, uh, Sweden, Denmark, the United Kingdom, countries like that. Uh, similar to the Greek monarchy in a way, I suppose, that uh, they were living in exile there for a while. I think the Greek uh, heir to the throne lives in exile in the UK. Juan Carlos I was living in Portugal, came back, and of course the uh, Spanish taxpayers footed his bill. And uh, one of the reasons for the transparency now is that because of all the problems that the former king has gone through recently, not declaring uh, assets, getting commissions for things around the world, problems with his uh, former lover, all of these scandals have put the royal family in the spotlight. And when you get a government that we have at the moment with Podemos, who's a, an anti-monarchy government, uh, anti-monarchy party, they, they're pushing for a republic again. Uh, the king has to be careful with what he does and what he says. And he thinks this is a way to um, help um, uh, build the name of the monarchy again, or the improve the tarnished reputation, let's say, of the monarchy. But uh, 2.5 is what he says he has in the in the bank with assets and things like that, because he doesn't own any property, I don't think. The, uh, the richest noble family in Spain is a family called the, uh, I think they're the Albas, the Duque de Alba, the Duke of Alba. I think they are the, one of the richest families in Spain, if not the richest um, noble family, let's say, and they have a lot of property and a lot of palaces and uh, a lot of wealth. But the royal family, no. A lot of titles as well, apparently. A lot of families, no. Now, we'll go back into the uh, chat section. Pat says, uh, COVID post-Easter spike shouldn't be surprising. Yeah, basically, that's what it is, Pat. It's uh, people that uh, caught COVID uh, over the Easter break. 
But um, I don't think the uh, health situation is as bad as it was, obviously, during the, the peak of the pandemic when the hospital system collapsed and all of those things and you couldn't get an, an appointment to see a doctor. I think uh, we are a lot better in that sense. But of course, if you catch COVID, you have to take time off work. Um, and basically, that's what's happening. So lots of people off work with COVID, not only here, but in other countries around the world as well. Uh, where I come from in Perth, a lot of people getting COVID at the moment because they kept it out for two years and then they realised that that wasn't a, a feasible option. So they opened the borders and uh, now down there, everybody is catching COVID. Everybody is catching COVID. But um, luckily, people are well protected against the virus now. So we don't have the same effect as we had a couple of years ago. Now let's uh, back into the uh, back into the chat section here. We'll get one more chat if I can. Let's see if I can find something here. Plenty of chat going on between people, which is good to see. Uh, Dave says, um, "I definitely try and keep out of politics." There, LOL could drive a man crazy. Don't know whether you're talking about Spain or the UK, Dave, but um, but uh, always a good idea to. Keep out of politics if you can. It can be a divisive topic, as we know, and there are plenty of divisive, divi divisive topics around at the moment that uh, trigger a lot of people, let's be honest. So we have to be careful what we say because we don't want to set too many people off. Now let's go uh, into the chat section, try to find one more chat if I can. If not, I'll start to wrap the video up. But um, yeah, okay, good. Can't find any more chats here. There is plenty of action going on, but I can't see any questions. So I'm going to start to wrap the video up because I've gone through the news. I've gone through the comments. Nothing really more to talk about today unless somebody wants to ask me a question, which you can if you want. Chrissy's come into the, uh, Chrissy's come into the chat. So we'll bring this one up here. And she says, we have lots of cases in Salah. Yeah, lots of cases everywhere, Chrissy. People still wearing masks inside and out. That is true. That is true. People still wearing masks here in Madrid as well, although uh, people are taking the mask off, mask off more and more as the days go by, as the days go by, especially when you go into a supermarket now, probably 50% masking and 50% not wearing masks. So uh, we're acting as if the pandemic doesn't exist. But as we know, a lot of people still catching COVID, unfortunately, and hopefully everybody uh, gets through their COVID bout, which I expect the majority will. All right, good. Now that's all for today. I'm going to say thank you, everybody, for your participation in the chat section. Plenty of activity happening today. Don't know whether we'll beat the uh, chat record or not. I don't think so. But uh, always good to see lots of activity happening in the chat section. Thank you very much for your participation in the chat section. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Not sure when it's going to be. Maybe on Saturday, maybe on Sunday. Until then, hasta luego. Have a good weekend. Buen fin de semana.